Hi everyone, and welcome to um, Stratton Mason's Lawyers webinar. This is our first webinar um, in relation to important legislation changes that have come in in recent times um, that may impact upon you and your clients. Uh, this is part of a new initiative that Stratton Mason Lawyers has put together, uh, where we're doing new quarterly presentations for accountants um, on different issues about the law. We want to keep them short and um, sweet and to the point. The idea is to help our accountants to keep up to date with the changes in the law. Um, and these are changes that not only affect your business, but also our um, your clients, because we all know that you know, all the changes in the law that do affect both our clients and your clients on a regular basis. Um, if you have any topics that are of interest to you, then um, please, at the end, we've, we've got a, a survey that we'd like everyone to fill in if they could. Uh, and so if you could fill in that and, and even make some suggestions of other topics that would be of interest to you, then uh, that'd be great. Um, there's facilities in um, the GoToWebinar software to ask questions as we're um, going through the talk. So please feel free to ask those questions at any time that, you've, that you like. Um, if you want to leave them to the end, that's also okay. Um, but um, Craig and I would be happy to, to answer any questions as we go. Um, the re presentation is being recorded, but I won't read out any names of people whose questions come up. Uh, we'll just go through them and, and, and ask the questions as we go. And it will also um, be available online if you want to revisit anything or if any of your um, colleagues want, want to revisit the um, seminar, we'll be recording all this and, and um, we'll be posting it online afterwards. Um, I'm also going to now send through a link to a, a um, Dropbox folder. So hopefully everyone can see that. This is a Dropbox folder that contains um, all of our um, slides so that you can have a copy of those. And it also contains some um, pretty cool um, extras that we're going to talk about um, towards um, during the talk um, that will be useful for yourselves and for your clients. So a little bit about us. So um, Stratton Mason Lawyers um, was started by Craig Mason who's on the right of the picture in front of you, and myself, Jeremy Stratton, back in 2011. Um, we started the, the business as, a, as just the two of us, um, and in the last four years, we've grown to a team of 12 full-time equivalents and about, I mean, it's about 14 staff on the picture that you can see in front of you. Um, we specialise in acting for small to medium-sized businesses and their owners, and we work really closely with accountants, and that's one of the reasons that we wanted to put this presentation together, and a series of presentations, because we work really closely with accountants and we wanted to give something back to accountants um, that we do work with. Um, we have two offices. We've got one in Morningside um, in Brisbane and uh, one in Caboolture in, um, in um, the Moreton Bay District. And we act for clients all over Queensland and even interstate where it applies. Uh, we provide specialist um, we provide specialist advice to businesses throughout their legal life cycle. So the two topics that we're going to talk about today, the first one is the changes um, that have come in that affect um, structuring for QVCC license holders. And the second one is the cipher changes. That's the Building and Construction Industry Payments Act. These are two very important topics for builder clients. We've found that, um, and we've done a number of these talks at accountants uh, or with accountants, and that accounts who deal with clients who are in the building game need to know these changes because they directly affect the advice that we give to those um, clients as we're going forward. And also it's, it's a good thing to know, you know what's, what changes are coming in for our clients going forward. I'm gonna go through the first part, the changes that affect structuring for QVCC license holders, and Craig will go through the Becipher changes um, in some detail afterwards. So what this, the, the first part of this, the changes that affect structuring for QVCC license holders is, is all about, is about what we as advisors, when we're advising uh, builders who are going to hold QVCC licenses, uh, what structures they need to be put in place. And there's been some, some pretty dramatic changes that came in on the 1st of July that haven't been very well publicised and that in our, in our view really affect the way that we as lawyers and you guys as accountants would need to structure the affairs of your clients going forward. So what we're talking about here is we're talking about uh, the structures for QVCC license holders. 
So pre um, 1 July 2015, uh, there was a concept um, of what is a relevant event. And a relevant event is where a company or a, a person goes into bankruptcy or a company goes into liquidation administration or has a controller appointed over the, over the company. Now, what that meant was that there was an event for the purpose of the QBCC and where you had one event, it was a five-year ban, and when you had two events, it had a life ban. So what that means is, say if they had a company that was trading, a building company that was trading, and it went into liquidation, they would be banned for for five years. If they also went bankrupt and the two weren't inextricably linked together, um, they would get a life ban for two, um, because they had two events. And that could be for any company. So it applied to not only building companies, but it also applied to uh, other companies that like we had clients who had uh, farms and um, and uh, and land holding companies that went into liquidation and they were uh, forced to uh, have a life ban because they had multiple entities. There was, however, the ability to apply for what we called a permitted individual. So what that was about was about the companies, uh, the the the. Um, saying to the QBCC that it wasn't our fault the company went down and we took all reasonable steps to avoid what uh, the company going to liquidation or the bankruptcy occurring. I'll just stop for a minute there. I've got a message um, from someone who can't see the Dropbox link. It should be in the chat folder. Um, can, there, can everyone else see it? I might post it again. Ah, oh, great. Yep, he's found it. Excellent. Thank you for that. All right, so yeah, so what, what we're talking about is the ability to apply for permanent individuals. So um, a good, good example of this is we've had um, many clients that we've acted for on this type of work. Um, one was where a guy had a um, his business partner, uh, who was the majority business holder, um, embezzled $2 million from the company accounts. And our guy had no idea. The other business partner admitted to the fact that he was he'd lied to us. Um, and everyone and basically everyone knew that that our guy didn't cause any any of the um, company to go into liquidation so after a bit of fighting with the QBCC we managed to get to get him through so that was the purpose of the legislation was there to protect those people who had companies go into uh, liquidation or went bankrupt from from losing their license if, if, it, if it happened through no fault of their own on the 1st of July the law changed and the law changed it was actually law that was uh, passed by the um, Liberal government before the election and then was assented to by the Labor government. So it's got support from both sides of, of, of Parliament. And, and what, what is a relevant event now? Well, it's still bankruptcy, including annulment. Uh, however, now to have a company event, so whether it be liquidation, administration, receivers being appointed, it now has to be a construction company. The term construction company hasn't been defined helpfully. Uh, we're hoping that there might be some more guidance that comes through in, in further legislation, um, but there even may be cases. But I think it's safe to say that a construction company will be a company that undertakes construction and probably one that holds a QVCC licence, because that makes sense to protect the um, to protect the licensing structures. And as I say, it, it now it applies to liquidation um, administration control for a construction company. It's also become easier where you have multiple events for you to say that one event was linked to another. So in the past, if you had, say, four different companies, one went into liquidation and then the dominoes all fell over, which quite often occurs, the, uh, the QVCC always had the view that, that they were separate events. The legislation has been made easier now to say that one group of companies going down is actually um, one event rather than multiple events. However, now, there's an, um, if you have one event, you have an automatic three-year ban, and there's no, um, there's no way to get around that. Uh, if you have two events, it's a life ban, and there's no more permitted individuals. So this means that where we've got a building company and they go into liquidation, the client will have a three-year ban, no questions asked. Um, the, um, and if they have two of those events, they have a life ban with no question asked. 
So what we need to be careful of, and, and really the crux of the, the point of this part of the seminar, is that where you've got a, a, comp a company structure where we're advising clients on setting up structures that are going to be in place for uh, their, their building companies, that they really need to have one construction company. They can't have multiple companies. There probably will be some argument over time uh, as to whether or not the uh, other companies that are related are actually construction companies, uh, but that's something that we'll, we'll have to look at and see what changes. Uh, I've got a couple of questions here, which I'll just um, have a look at. One question is, is, um, is it voluntary winding up? Is that included as an event? And, and yes, it is. I've, I've actually had that, that question before, and a lot of people don't realise that if you um, have a member's voluntary winding up of a construction company, that can actually um, lead to one of these events and, and have the, the, um, the directors of that company banned for, for um, well, now, now it's an automatic ban for three years. Um, I've got another question here about does the three-year ban apply to all companies that hold an individual license? So what the, the ban is, it applies to a person. So say if Jeremy Stretton owned Stretton um, Builders, Proprietary Limited, and Stretton Builders went into liquidation, then Jeremy Stretton could not be a director or an influential person in a company that held a, a building license. I would have to basically become an employee for someone else. So anyone who is affected by these provisions would be... Uh, would be forced to go and work for someone else. Does that answer that question? Um, another question uh, that I've had is whether or not uh, it applies to previous events. So often, um, and I did a lot of this work, you might have a, a client who had one or two events and uh, because of the way that their structure was and their finances, they didn't challenge uh, the permitted individual. and um, a lot of people think that that should not apply to the new legislation. And the truth of the matter is, at the moment, it does. So if you have a, a client who already faces a ban and they face another ban, then they could be banned for, for life uh, with no um, ability to apply to hold the building licence at all. So, so, so it's something to, to consider in depth. If you've got clients who are, who are uh, facing liquidation and they have construction companies or they have in the past, then it's probably a good idea to, to speak to us or speak to another lawyer just to make sure that your, your structures are right um, and that, that they've considered all the options that they have before they um, do anything like put companies into liquidation or voluntary um, winding up. All right, well, look, I'm going to finish there and I'm going to hand over to Craig for his talk on the Besipe changes. Um, if you've got any other questions for me, um, please feel free to, to send them through and we'll, we'll talk about them at the end. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Jeremy said, we're now talking about the Building and Construction Industry Payments Act. Uh, it's a Queensland Act. It was brought in in 2004. Uh, there are similar acts across Australia in different states. Um, they have the same effect. They, they are called uh, you know, different, different titles, but basically the same. Um, as I said, they came in in 2004, uh, and the purpose of the act was uh, to keep the flow of payments uh, to contractors throughout the building and construction industry. So um, there was a lot of uh, larger type companies that were withholding payments. Um, so they brought in these types of acts to stop that happening. Um, the basic attitude of the act is that uh, you're to pay uh, the invoice now. Um, and if there is a fight, then the fight is had at a later date. So it's to keep the money flowing through the industry. Now, the purpose of why we're even speaking about it today is that uh, there were some changes that came in late 2014 that are slowly starting to filter through the industry because contracts are now being entered into in 2015 and uh, this Act now applies to those. So the changes apply uh, for, from the date of the contract. So anything before um, late last year, uh, the old Act will apply and any contracts entered into this year uh, this new Act will apply, including all the changes. So obviously the benefits of the Act are uh, that a subcontractor in most instances get, gets paid uh, quicker. Uh, it helps eliminate disputes and should do uh, prevent court action, hopefully, um, depending on the circumstances. So um, that's the purpose. Now, you might think that it's only to do with builders, um, or you know, larger type construction companies, but it actually is quite broad in, in who it applies to. So um, 
as I said, it doesn't just apply to to builders. Uh, it also applies to uh, someone that might be installing uh, heating or, or lighting, uh, air conditioning, ventilation, uh, power supply, uh, drainage, uh, sanitation, water supply, fire protection, uh, security and communication systems. Um, it also includes the internal and external of uh, cleaning of buildings, um, so far as they are carried out in the actual course of their construction. So if it's the, the final clean, for instance, of a of a building, um, then that would apply to, this act would apply to that. Um, a lot of people may not be aware that it actually also applies to related goods and services, um, which might include, uh, you know, the labour to carry out construction work, uh, architects, uh, designers, surveyors, uh, quantity surveyors, uh, engineers, uh, internal and exterior decoration, uh, landscape advisory, and soil testing. So it, it's quite broad, um, but the key to it is that it doesn't apply for uh, domestic building work. So um, if your one of your clients is doing work for um, mum and dad at their house, um, they were doing some air conditioning, for instance, then it wouldn't apply. This act wouldn't apply to that. So it's, it's primarily for, for instance, a builder and a subcontractor. Um, and so we find that a lot of accountants obviously have clients that are subcontractors and they come across this act um, on an occasion and they may not realise um, that on their tax invoices that most of their clients would issue, um, if they have the, this is a payment claim under the act on there, then this act, um, provided a few other things are uh, complied with, then it's then it's live um, and, and can be used to their advantage. So, um, yeah, the key to it is that it doesn't apply to a, a resident um, or an owner that's going to be a resident as well. So there's a six-month period there. All right, so you'll see the, the next slide is the uh, BESIPA regime, and I've, I've made it into a, a flow chart. Um, there's a lot of dates in there. Uh, it's very hard to keep track of. So we've developed a, a checklist that we've included in the in the handouts that you would have got uh, via the link from Jeremy to Dropbox um, that we encourage all of our subcontractor clients to adopt something like that. They can obviously um, use the one that we've done, but we encourage everyone to have some form of checklist in place because as you can see from that uh, flow chart there, um, there's a number of different um, business day um, conditions that, that need to be adhered to. Uh, and there are no extensions um, allowed under the Act in, in any circumstance. So if it's 10 business days and you do something on the 11th, um, you're out of time. So the changes that came through there, you'll see on the flowchart, we've got a simple claim and a complex claim. They've changed it to be a complex claim is now anything over 750000 and obviously a simple claim is anything under 750000 with the complex claim, it could be that the the actual claim is for 700,000, um, but they the uh, builder, for instance, agrees to pay 600,000, leaving obviously a balance of 100,000. That's still counted as a complex claim and needs to be dealt with under that um, regime. So once you do your payment claim, um, which basically in the in the industry at the moment is a tax invoice, um, it's got to say that it's a payment claim under the Act. Uh, it's got to describe the works um, adequately. We encourage all of our clients to put in things like the site address or the, uh, the project name or something that um, can identify the work so there's no confusion. Um, and it's got to be issued according to a reference date under the contract. So, um, for instance, if a contract said that every invoice must be issued on the, the, fifth, uh, the 15th of each month and you issued it before then, then the act, your payment claim would be invalid on that on that basis because you've you've gone early essentially. But if all those things are, are right and you serve your payment claim, um, you've then got the time period under the act, which currently is for a simple claim, 10 business days. Um, so again, in our checklist, um, we encourage our clients to put down those dates um, so they can diarise the time. And it's become more important now to 
to know those days uh, because the changes now are that uh, a respondent gets basically a second chance to make payment. So uh, pre-2000, uh, end of 2014, uh, you did your payment claim, waited the 10 business days. If you didn't get a response, then you could go straight to either court or to adjudication. Now, to try to make it, um, uh, to correct some perceived unfairness towards a respondent, they've allowed a second chance. So you'll see on that flow chart, um, bottom right-hand corner, um, the second chance. And now you've, you've got to comply with these days. If you don't, you won't be successful in using it. You've got 20 business days to basically issue a um, second chance. And the second chance um, has to give the person a further five business days to respond. So that's one of the key changes that um, you have to be on top of and your clients need to be aware that they can't just send out payment claims anymore. They have to diarise the 10 business days in order to comply with the second chance. If they don't do the second chance, then they're unable to use that payment claim as a, um, as a means to collect the money and they basically will have to start again. Um, so it's very important that it's diarised um, and you know, you've got the days, you've got to calculate the days. There is a business um, day calculator if anyone's not sure how to do that um, on the QBCC uh, website. Uh, one of those other changes as well is the QBCC, which is the Queensland Building Construction Commission, now oversees all of these things um, and all uh, applications under the adjudication now have to go through the QBCC. They then farm out the adjudication um, applications to uh, an adjudication uh, company and the decision is made from there. So the way adjudication works is that um, you've issued your payment claim and the respondent has to issue either a payment schedule within those time periods um, or if they don't, then you can do adjudication or you can go to court. Uh, one of the changes they made in uh, with the complex claim is that before in your payment schedule you had to raise every single reason as to why you weren't paying it. Anything you didn't raise in that payment schedule you were unable to rely upon down the track. That is the same with the simple claim but with a complex claim you can rely on other things down the track. So tactically, um, we're pretty sure we're going to see people putting uh, you know, a small amount of reasons in the payment schedule and then withholding a large amount of information that will then, then come up with um, in the adjudication or, or at court. So um, that's one thing to, to bear in mind if you're dealing with any clients that might have a, a complex claim. But um, it then goes to adjudication and essentially an adjudicator then makes a decision um, based solely on written submissions. So there's no chance to get in front of anyone and, and make oral submissions and argue any points. It's all based on written submissions. Um, you can include photographs and those sorts of things and any other financials or whatever it is you might want to include. But whatever you put in there, um, that's it. Uh, the adjudicator does have the power to ask for further submissions about um, certain things, but um, rarely does that seem to happen. So you're basically in the hands of um, a person that um, you know, may or may not have particular experience in the, the plumbing dispute or whatever it might be, um, who's then going to make a decision. And that decision is essentially a judgment um, that can be registered in the relevant court and enforced the same way as any other magistrate's court judgment or district court judgment. Um, so there's obviously, you know, it's an important um, process and again, there's a number of dates within that that need to be complied with and they're, it, it, they're all strict time frames. So um, once the application's made, there's a certain period of time where you need to do your response and if you don't do your response within a certain period of time, um, then your submissions will not be taken into account. Um, so yeah, you've got to um, be on top of your, your time frames. Um, the other option is, other than adjudication, is to go to a court. Uh, and that's done the same way as it always was, except you have to have given that second chance to the respondent in order to, to rely on that. 
and that's by way of an application to the court for a judgment. Uh, and going back to the purpose of the Act, um, you're unable to bring a counterclaim in those proceedings or a defence. So basically, you've got to wear the judgment unless there's a jurisdictional issue, um, namely that the payment claim is not a not a valid one. Um, but if they, all those things stack up, then judgment should be awarded, and then um, obviously payment should be made. And then if it's an overpayment or there's defective works or whatever it might be that there's a dispute over, that's fought fought out at a at a later date, um, and normally not at all, which is the the whole purpose of purpose of the Act. Um, so that's the court section. So as I said, the changes, we've got the old contracts, QBCC are now uh, overseeing everything. Um, the changing time, so we've got the different days. Again, we encourage everyone to use our checklist or something like that. And most importantly, the, the second, second chance. Um, just before any questions, the in your handouts, you've also got there uh, a sample uh, payment claim uh, and a sample payment schedule. You'll see there the payment claim is really just a tax invoice and the, the title of it is, in fact, tax invoice, um, which is what we encourage all our clients to do, mainly um, just to not to alert the respondent necessarily or the fact that it's a payment claim. Um, payment schedule is there as well. Um, that needs to be um, correct. It's got to refer to the payment claim. Um, it's got to, if you're going to say you're not paying a particular amount, then you've got to give the reasons uh, and to make sure that's right. So that's what you've got in your handout as well. Um, and also the checklist, which I've spoken about. Now, we've got a question here about the Subcontractors Charges Act, which again is a, is a different act that's been around for a while. It's in um, several other states in Australia. And that's essentially where you've got a, a head contractor, for instance, or a developer, a builder, and then a subcontractor. The way that act works is that the subcontractor could issue a charge to, say, the developer to say that they're owed money by the, the builder for their plumbing work, for instance. Um, and essentially, it's bypassing the middle, middle person um, and provided there's no, um, that they comply with all the provisions under the Act, then the developer should pay the subcontractor rather than paying the builder. Um, the problem with that, of course, is that it's all a matter of timing. Um, you, it's useless if uh, the, the developer's already paid the builder, obviously, because they're not going to pay, pay twice. But the most important thing while we're talking about the Subcontractors Charges Act and the Building Construction Industry Payments Act is you can't rely on both of these acts at the same time. So you've got to pick one. Um, if you uh, use one, you can't use the other and vice versa. So, um, I've, yeah, so that answers the question that we've got here that how does it interact with the Subcontractors Charges Act? Essentially, yeah, it, it can't interact with it. Um, you've got to do it separately. So, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. All right. Uh, if there's no other questions, um, if you have any, quickly, madly type them now. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, feel, uh, feel free to email us. Uh, there's Jeremy and myself. There's our email addresses there. Uh, if you've got any questions or... Uh, want to have a chat about a client or a particular circumstance that you, one of your clients is facing, then please let us know. Um, as we also said, at uh, Jeremy said at the beginning, um, you know, we're hopeful of doing these quarterly. If you've got any other topics that you think um, might be relevant to you, um, we're happy to uh, consider those and put something together for the next quarterly webinar. Um, so if you've got any of those uh, types of suggestions, then please uh, let us know. We've also got a survey um, that we were hoping the attendees could fill out. Um, so a couple of quick questions just about the webinar and whether you enjoyed it. Obviously answer it um, uh, truthfully as much as possible. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone.
Right, Jeremy Stratton here again. Yeah, there's no, there's no further questions. So um, thank you everyone for attending. And um, yeah, that, that questionnaire should pop up directly after the webinar. So if you do have anything anything else that you'd like to talk to us about, just um, just let us know. And if you'd like to sign up to the next webinar in, um, in the next quarter, we'll, um, we'll send that around when we're um, ready to do it. Thanks very much, everyone.